Hello everyone and um, welcome to another lockdown lecture. Uh, this time we wanted to talk a little bit about metal detecting. Uh, so how we use it at Waterloo but also how it can be used on other archaeological sites and how it fits in with the archaeological process. So as you'll have seen from, from the other lockdown lectures, uh, we use metal detectors quite a lot at Waterloo. They're a vital tool on most um, battlefield sites as well, and in fact they're increasingly becoming used as a matter of course on, on all sorts of different archaeological sites. So firstly, um, I'm absolutely no expert on metal detectors, um, and at Waterloo we have a number of locals, other experts and also veterans now who are just way more qualified with metal detecting than I am. So I don't want to get into the um, technical details here. Um, beyond just quickly, you know, a metal detector works by essentially transmitting a um, electro electromagnetic field into the ground uh, from their search coil. And then any metal objects within the electromagnetic field will become kind of energized by this field. And then they start retransmitting uh, electromagnetic field of their own. So then the detector's search coil uh, receives that kind of retransmitted electromagnetic field and then alerts the user by producing a, a, a response in their ear, usually a beeping or, or, or also on the, um, on the gauge on the, on the handle of the detector. There's hundreds of different detectors and if you're into it, you're, you're, you're really into it. Um, but, uh, you know, they can, they can detect iron deposits or gold or whatever they have all sorts of different settings to detect different things and a lot of them go you know very shallow to, to some very deep ones um, and we have had all sorts of different detector, uh, detectors and detectorists in fact involved with us at Waterloo and it's been great to, to really explore how it all works but first things first um, archaeology and metal detecting has what could be known as a checkered history uh, and it's still considered by some people um, as quite a controversial subject. So previously, I mean, it's getting much, much, much better now, but previously a lot of archeologists that you would have talked to would have been extremely disparaging about um, metal detectorists, respectively accusing them of treasure hunting or night hawking, which is when you go onto a site illegally without the owner's permission or, or a, you know, a known archeological site without proper permissions. And, and, you know, there's people will often say, oh, um, metal detectorists don't ever record their fines, so they just take it home and, and, and don't tell anyone about it. This is changing really, really a lot, and I'll explore this a bit over the next few minutes. But, but it is important to highlight this tension because it does still persist. And I guess as with, um, as with anything, there's good and bad eggs. There are, there are you know, responsible and... There are irresponsible detectorists, just as they're responsible and irresponsible archaeologists. So, one of our one of our aims here at Waterloo Uncovered, at least, is to is to enable and to teach responsible metal detecting. So, archaeologists and detectorists working in harmony with each other, um, instead of working against each other. And, and hopefully, you'll see that it has worked extremely well for us, um, and it's a really great model to take forward. So let's get a little bit first into the how of um, how we use metal detectors, metal detectors at Waterloo Uncovered and then how they can be used on site to kind of aid in and, and often they guide the archaeological process. So normally when we're digging a, an archaeological site, we're very interested in what's known as the stratigraphy and we've probably been over this before, but essentially they're the layers um, that are built up over time in the ground, as you can see in this diagram here. But um, when you're working on a battlefield, especially where the battle's only fought over a, you know, one day and there hasn't been much chance for um, digging defensive features like you know, um, ditches or trenches or anything like that, there's usually very, very little stratigraphy. You know, we're looking for an extremely thin layer. And um, that essentially means we don't find very much in the way of deposits lying on top of each other in the buried soil. So instead we're just looking for this one horizon, this one very small thin layer. Um, so if we look at this diagram here, in this case, the layer we'd be looking for would be something like this 
layer of 18th century cobbles. So you can see all of this other stuff going on in this diagram. Loads of stuff, Romans, Saxons, you know, all sorts of things, Iron Age, etc., modern stuff. And we're just looking for this tiny, tiny little layer of the battle. So rather than when we're doing battlefield archaeology, at least, rather than looking for lots of structures and ditches and pits, it's, it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like trying to record the remains of a festival like Glastonbury. We <laughs> imagine coming out, you know, coming back after Glastonbury, and then you have to kind of record all of this stuff. Um, essentially, we're looking for all of the rubbish and the detritus left behind after just one or two days of of complete carnage, basically. So we haven't got any stratigraphy or very much stratigraphy, and that's really where the metal detectors come in. Um, <clears throat> So much of this detritus from the battlefield, especially one like Waterloo, is made of metal, right? And so using the detectors is a, is a perfect way to cover a really large area quite fast, but also in a kind of controlled and systematic way. Obviously, we don't just get battle era, era stuff, we also get a whole bunch of modern stuff as well, the classic things like ring pulls or bottle tops, and even, you know, we found, as you can see on this slide, we found someone's glasses once. Um, so we take all of this stuff and we record all of it. It means a lot of work for the finds team, but it's really important to get an idea of the spread of everything that's going across the across the um, area we're looking at. You know, whether that's modern stuff or whether that's Napoleonic stuff or whether that's stuff from, from earlier periods as well. So let's take a little um, quick example here. So this photo is from the... Um, the killing zone, which I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with now, but it's just outside the south wall of, of Hougamont Farm. I'll just put up the, the map of Hougamont again to show you the various areas. Now, as you'll have heard from previous lockdown lectures, the, the killing zone is a really interesting area for us because it's a, a piece of open ground that the French had to cross um, after fighting their way through the woodland and then before attempting to scale the um, the walls of Hougamont just there into the formal garden. Now this area, the killing zone, was always a target for us because of this reason, because it was so um, vigorously fought over. So when we ran our, when we first ran our metal detectors over it, we were, we were disappointed and surprised that we only found actually, we only found two musket balls in total. So this was in, you know, quite a stark contrast to the other areas that we'd looked at, um, which all had quite a good collection of musket balls. And so here you can just, um, you can vaguely see the results from the first, from the very first season. The white rectangles here, um, the white rectangles are the, <coughs> excuse me, the transects that the detectorist walked along. And this is a really important thing about again, trying to do metal detecting responsibly and as part of the wider archaeological project is when you're detecting on a site like this, it's really important that people don't just wander off randomly across the site and randomly detect anywhere. Because we really need to know which bits have been detected and you know who they were detected by and when they were detected um, so that we can just keep a track of everything so we know exactly what we've done, basically. So in this system, everyone walks down a specific transect. Now on the ground, these are usually marked by bamboo poles. So you might start at one bamboo pole and walk in a straight line um, to another one. And basically you just detect in that area. So you have your own sweeping and you just detect within that area. Often this will just give us a, a wide sample of the of the site. So it might we might not cover every single square meter of the ground. Um, but it gives us a really good picture of the overall patterning. And then if there's anything super interesting, we can go back and do the transects. You know, rather than doing them north-south, we can do them east-west and, and we can expand on that a little bit. But we just really needed people to walk, we really require people to walk in transects so that we've got kind of total coverage, basically. So if I just take those transects away, you can see the results from the very first season. Um, and there they are, the two musket balls up in the killing zone. So from this first tranche of metal detecting, it really looked like perhaps uh, some previous metal detecting had already taken place. Now, the battlefield of Waterloo is a protected battlefield in Belgium. Um, so in, in fact, it's metal detecting is completely prohibited um, in that area. 
uh, outside, of course, of a officially sanctioned archaeological project like um, like Waterloo Uncovered. So illegal metal detecting, of course, takes place across the battlefield. Um, and it looked like the killing zone had been hit quite hard, mainly probably because it's quite easy to hide in there. It's behind a wall, there's some trees, all that kind of stuff. You can be quite, you know, you can do it, you can do it covertly there rather than necessarily walking across open, the open fields um, with a metal detector. So this got us a bit worried um, because we, we thought, oh God, everything's been, everything's been robbed in the past. But, but we thought we'd try a little bit harder and, and eventually stripped off a bit of topsoil in some of the areas in the killing ground. And so you can see from this picture, again, this picture, that uh, the amount of, of flags that came up, the amount of responses that came up when we did this. Um, and if I just show you this one, yeah, so this is the same trench, but we've just picked out the, the musket balls there. And you can see the difference that this stripping made from two in the entire area of, of the killing zone. We've got something like 15 or something in just a five meter wide strip. So it, it made a huge, huge difference. Um, so let's just stop again on this image and then I'll explain the kind of process of how it all works because we've got quite a lot going on just in this one picture. So first of all, the flags. Every time a detectorist uh, gets a response on their detector, um, they pop in a flag to mark it. Different coloured flags mean different responses. In this case, most of these are yellow responses. There, there might be an orange one in there somewhere. Uh, so the yellow ones are just a general kind of um, a general response, but you know, if there's um, responses which seem deeper or or, or a different uh, metal or what have you, they might get a different flag. Uh, so all of the responses in the in the stripped area, first of all, are, are flagged, um, and then each one is is dug up. So you can see someone digging one up in the background there. I know we dig every single response. Um, obviously. Sometimes it's, you know, just a piece of old scrap iron, a bit of old tractor or something. Uh, sometimes it's incredible. Sometimes it's a, you know, a Napoleonic button. Um, mostly it's the former, mostly it's a whole bunch of old crappy iron. But, you know, we make sure that we dig everything and we record everything in the same way, um, just in case. So once the find's dug, the find is then surveyed um, and uh recorded and and bagged so you see the guys in the background there they've got the gps stick um and they're essentially picking up each find that's been dug giving it a unique number giving it a full 3d gps location so we can mark exactly where it is on a map or where we found it on a map and then it's put in a bag and um, taken back to the finds hut for uh, further investigation and if you all have if you've been watching the other lockdown lectures, you'll see the results of this metal detecting has been really impressive. Uh, and it's really helped build up a picture of the activity across Hougoumont, but also across the whole battlefield. We, we do a metal detecting survey before we dig any holes or anything, just to, just to make sure, you know, we've, we've got a good coverage there. So, um, so we've actually done quite a few areas now and we've pulled up some incredible stuff. But one last point about, um, before I finish, about kind of responsible metal detecting, and this goes back a little bit to an earlier point about uh, stratigraphy. So if we madly go round and rip things out of the ground without due kind of care and attention, what we do is that we essentially take that object out of its stratigraphic location. We, lo we lose its place in the stratigraphic sequence and we lose, we lose its context. And I've talked about context before. Um, context for archaeologists is really key. So, as I've said before, like a, if we dig a coin or a button using a metal detector and we just pull it out of the ground, that coin or that button might be part of a wider deposit that is still buried. Um, like a, like a, it might be a button off a whole uniform or it might be a coin out of a money bag or what, whatever. And if we just take that one item out without recording its context, without recording where it is, where it was found, um, what it looked like when it came out of the ground, we can't understand the rest of the deposit. It's, it's ripped out of its context and we'll never find out how it all fitted together again. 
So this is quite bad on a battlefield, but this is, you know, doubly bad if you go off and if one goes off and metal detects elsewhere, um, kind of, you know, on your own, you might go off to a, you know, a local farmer's field, metal detects, find some cool stuff and not let anybody know about it, not let the wider community know what you've found. Because again, you're ripping it out of context and also you're not then able to say, oh, I found this really cool thing, it was found here, maybe it's part of a wider a wider deposit, something much more interesting than just the, the single coin that you found. So most countries um, in Europe and, and North America will have um, their own kind of metal detecting uh, fine liaison schemes. In the UK, it's called the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Now the, or the PAS or PAS or PAS. PAS isn't just for metal detectorists. Um, it's for anybody who goes out and finds anything on the ground um, as you're walking about. Um, but essentially, every county has a what's known as a fines liaison officer, and you can take your fines to the fines liaison officer. And hopefully, when you take your fine to them, you'll have already bagged them up properly, and you'll have um, taken a photo of where you got them from and recorded the GPS. I mean, most people's smartphones now have got GPS on them and, you know, it usually attaches the GPS to the to the photo. So hopefully people now can just, if they find something, take a photo of it with their phone and it will have also recorded the, um, the geographic location as well. So you take your finds to them with all of that information and then you can have them identified for you if you don't know how to do it or you don't know what it is. And then they all get put into a national database which records not just what it was, but also the photos of where you found it and and the location of where you found it. They all go into this big national database. And so as you can see here from the from the PAS site, you know, by recording these finds with the Portable Antiquities Scheme or the, you know, equivalent scheme in, in your own country. It means that other people can do research on your finds. They can analyze patterning across the whole of the country, a bit like we do at Waterloo, where we take a whole you know, wide look at, look at the patterns of the metal finds at Waterloo. If everyone who is pulling stuff up out of the ground and, and metal detecting responsibly sends in the information for where they found everything, then we can look at those patterns across the whole country. You know. What's the spread of this particular type of Anglo-Saxon coin, or you know, where where do these where do these brooches come from, and you know, what's the pattern of that? Can it show us where they were made, or something like that? So, if you do this, it means that everybody can benefit from you know the the hard work of the detectorists walking across the field, and not just not just the detectorists themselves. And for us at Waterloo Uncovered, I guess the the beauty of metal detecting is is that it allows you to have some alone time if you want. So if you if you if you know our participants are sick of everyone else, they can just put on their headphones and they can go and do some walking across an open field. You just listen to the beeps, and it's a lot of people find it quite calming, quite quite um, quite good for them. Um, but also, as we've shown at Waterloo, um, uncovered having this ability to to do this to take this time out effectively but then detecting kind of together as part of the whole team it just means that it's um it's way more responsible and it's way more fun it's way more sociable and ultimately our participants have definitely found that it's it's actually way more therapeutic to do it all as part of a team so um that's the end of the lecture for this for today and uh, thank you for listening i hope it was helpful and if you've got any questions or anything just drop me a line